hopping on again yeah. this week. For those of you who can see the slides, you'll see that we're gonna focus after we get through uh, some of the business of the waivers to focus on self-care and to remind folks that it's not selfish, that you need to put your face mask on first before helping children and old people in the seats next to you. So we're gonna start this week's uh, time together with a moment of silence. We're acutely aware that folks near and dear to us have uh, died from COVID-19. Staff members, family members, uh, acquaintances across the country. So if you'll just join me now in uh, a moment of silence. John, can I just quickly add something? Yes. Um, I don't know if people have heard, but um, the former Demas Commissioner, Dr. Tom Kirk, uh, passed away last week from COVID-19. So, um, it, it, you know, it's particularly hitting home for some of us who worked with him. Um, Thank you. I mean, not that it hasn't hit home otherwise. I shouldn't, I don't mean it that way. Yeah. It's just, yep. um, so I do appreciate the moment of silence. Now I'll stop talking. Okay, thank you. And uh, we will continue to hold everyone in our thoughts and prayers as we go on. A reminder that uh, today's focus is gonna be on self-care. So I will invite you to breathe in and breathe out at your own leisure. And Andrea will walk us through some other uh, self-care items. The agenda is the same as we have done historically welcome introductions, announcements, we have updates from our partners, and then we'll do the on the ground strategies, next steps. And just a reminder that at 1230, our regular balance of state steering committee will be held. So some of you will be jumping on at 1230 after you get a short half hour break to grab some lunch. So without further ado, we've got some announcements. The first is a link to a really robust website. This particular link is focused on social distancing in congregate shelter, but if you explore around on the site, there are other really good tips and ideas that could be helpful for all of us as we continue our work. Next Thursday, there's going to be a particular conversation for Connecticut outreach providers, you'll see on your slide, same time, uh, but different date. We will meet again as a group on Friday, but this is in particular for the Connecticut outreach providers hosted by Demas and staffed by Housing Innovations. So if this is a particular interest of yours, feel free to jump on that call and Zoom meeting next Thursday. Just a reminder that we do have a place where we're collecting all of the responses to provider questions. Again, it's a robust page on the ctboss.org website. You're encouraged to go and see all of the resources that we've gathered there for you, as well as responses from our previous times together. And ctbosscoc at gmail.com. Feel free to hit us up day and night with your questions, with your concerns. We'll do the best to answer them as soon as we can. So we'll move on to any updates from Department of Housing. Uh, Lee, or Kara, or Steve? I think Lee is here. Yep. This is this is Lee. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, so as you know, I think our CANs have been ag aggressively working to get settled in the motels um, over the past week, week and a half. That transition has gone remarkably well. Um, and I think right now, many of the CANs are, are really working to um, figure out what that service capacity and staffing is going to look like in each of the 13 motels that are across the state. Um, so fortunately, um, I think it, again, it's been a relatively smooth 
transition. Um, I think the providers have done an outstanding job um, to make this transition and, and to really make the staffing work there. Um, so now the conversations in the local communities are really starting to pivot to how do we start to aggressively move people out um, into roommate situations, rooming houses, any, any of those permanent housing options that, that are available to people. So, um, so kind of the, the, the next phase of work is, is now starting to happen in each of the communities. Um, I think at DOH, we are continuing conversations about the CARES Act and the allocations that are available to Connecticut, both in ESG and CDBG funding. Um, so we, we hope to have more information out as soon as possible um, about that. Um, do you wanna go to the next slide? Am I controlling the? Uh, who's controlling the slides? There we go. Uh, so the, the other update is, um, oops, um, the governor's office released the um, new information pertaining to evictions through an executive order this week um, that came out, I think, I think it was a week ago on, on Friday. Um, so right now, the new updates are that landlords cannot send a notice to quit or start an eviction case until July 1st, um, except in instance, instances of a serious nuisance. Um, and there is currently an automatic 60-day grace period for April rent, um, meaning that a landlord cannot charge late fees, interest, or other penalties for April. Um, and a similar grace period is going to be extended for May rent for renters. Um, so again, um, if someone is requesting um, a rent deferment for the month of May, they would need to do that in writing uh, within nine days of the rental due date. Um, and they also must cite um, COVID-related uh, reasons if they would like to get that 60-day grace period from the landlord. And uh, if someone has paid two months worth of security deposit or, or any, anything more than a month, um, that the tenant can request that the landlord apply that extra month of security deposit to, um, to a month's worth of rent. Um, so in many, of, many cases, I'm hoping that our tenants won't need the 60-day grace period because we do have the capability to adjust rent based on any changes in, in the household income. Um, certainly for our rapid rehousing providers, we've been talking a lot with them about allowing 100% worth of rental assistance for April and May. Um, you know, we can also talk about extending that uh, through June, June as well. Um, but I think, you know, really it's looking at, at least for rapid rehousing, it's looking at your budgets to determine um, whether or not there's enough available rental assistance in your budgets to be able to offer that full 100% of rental assistance. I'll pause for any questions. Great, just a reminder folks, we have a Q&A box this morning instead of uh, the chat box. So feel free to ask any questions. We will take time in a few slides to pause and ask for any questions and answers up until that point. And just a reminder to any of the housing innovation staff that if you're not on mute, um, please do that if you're not speaking. Um, next up, we have Alice from Demas. Thanks, John. I was just taking myself off of mute, which um, was a good reminder to me to do that. Um, so we have some quick uh, brief updates from Demas. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, we, Demas, submitted um, a proposal to SAMHSA for their COVID-19 emergency grants. It was due last Friday. Um, if awarded, the state will get uh, $2 million starting May 1st for 16 months. Um, and included in that ask was some funding for additional mobile outreach staff 
to have an expertise in homelessness um, to assist with shelters, hotels, and encampments. Um, as John stated earlier, uh, next Thursday, there is a um, outreach training that Housing Innovations is um, doing. Uh, there'll be another one in May. Um, um, we also, your quality assurance staff should have received an email, a provider alert email from our um, EQMI, um, Evaluation Quality Management Improvement. Um, department are talking about new codes in DDAP for telehealth. Um, so if you um, haven't received that information from your quality, uh, your quality department or your compliance um, or uh, data quality staffing, just ask for, ask for that. I'm going to also have, um, make sure that all the providers get it. So I'll be working with our director of EQMI to make sure that everyone in um, support of housing got that. So again, that's related to different codes in DDAP um, for the telehealth. Um, also there's, uh, um, I'm sorry, the, some of the folks in New Haven put together some statewide resources regarding food resources. So I can um, have that be sent out as well. Um, Finally, uh, we, not finally, we've also had some requests related to waivers for the DEMAS programs during this time, mostly related to the fact that people are working from home, so um, getting signatures in real time isn't necessarily possible. Um, obviously, face-to-face -face contacts will probably be down. Um, and so we're going to be working on getting a document out related to that. And now finally, um, for any of the CANs that need Narcan, you can reach out to Brenda Earl um, at DEMAS to um, request any Narcan kits. So I think those are the DEMAS updates. Um, so if any, but, if it, but I will pause to see if anyone has any questions. I don't see the scoreboard lighting up, so we'll move on and remind people well, to use Q&A. We did have one question related. Um, Jen Paradise asked, are we expecting an increase of eviction hearings as backlog from the hold to, to landlords, including those that were previously in process and citing other issues outside the lack of rental payments? So I'm not sure if that was for, um, Department of Housing, or if that was um, just a general question. Lee, can you see that question? Um, I, I I can't see it, but that that's okay. Um, I I think we we don't we don't really know if at this point in time. Um, I think what's what's going to happen in terms of eviction. Um, I think at, at DOH, we are anticipating creations of eviction prevention programs um, using our ESG allocations. What that will look like exactly, I, I don't know yet, um, but we are anticipating the need for, uh, for funding to support prevention efforts. Actually, this is Steve. I think um, my information shows that we have about between 700 and 800 folks that were kind of in the queue in the eviction process between March 1st and when the governor declared that sometime in the March 20th range. Um, so uh, those are there, but if you really think about it, those evictions were not caused directly by COVID. Uh, so those were probably from non-payment or rent issues or lease violations from sometime in January, February. So I think those will be the first ones up. Um, DOH is actively looking to assist those households um, if and when we get our funding uh, for an eviction prevention program. So they certainly are on our radar and um, we will work it out once we have a little more details. Great, thanks Steve. Uh, David Gonzalez Rice is here, I see, from CCEH and uh, I'm sure he will plug it, but if you're not receiving the distributions from CCH, make sure that you get on that list. It's chock full of really good information. One came out this morning. And uh, David, what do you have to add? Thanks very much for that cross promotion, John. I'll um, line your pocket later. 
with praise. Uh, so what we've got here is um, uh, CCH has been focused for the last week really on um, assessing strengths and gaps in our infectious disease protocols for homeless shelters and other agencies serving uh, people experiencing homelessness across the state. We've been doing this again as uh, part of the state's emergency support function work groups, working with Department of Housing, Department of Public Health, and others. Uh, many of you filled out a survey that went out uh, from uh, Bo Anderson and from myself, uh, soliciting uh, information about your health protocols and infectious disease protocols. We got 38 responses to that, which helped us paint a picture uh, for our state partners uh, of uh, where things are uh, in place and where there is need to uh, provide some support and uh, uh, develop protocols that may be underdeveloped in some communities. Uh, we actually have a call this afternoon at two o'clock, uh, the state's uh, state unified command, emergency support function six working group on health protocols where we will present uh, some of this uh, information both from the survey and from a uh, scan of model protocol documents from Fairfield County, uh, from New London, and then outside of Connecticut, we looked at New York City, Los Angeles County, state of North Carolina. Um, so a few areas we know need some shoring up uh, statewide uh, include um, transitions between care settings, uh, particularly between hospitals and shelters. Uh, getting more clear for our uh, partners in the hospitals about how they access uh, step-down care or uh, what the state's calling uh, COVID recovery centers that are not CAN-managed facilities, but for other people who uh, need a place to go and are not able to go home, uh, some of those um, processes have been uh, more centrally planned or more transparent in other uh, communities and uh, Connecticut's still kind of building out that process. We've had a lot of inquiries from the hospitals about what to do with folks who did not come from shelter but um, aren't able to go back where they were living. Uh, and uh, I just want to report that in tandem with this, while we're working on the statewide level to to collect information and, and try to build the template uh, for um, all the guidance that's going to be needed across the CANs, the Department of Public Health really has been effectively partnering to uh, link the, the CANs and the local shelter providers with their local health departments uh, and doing a lot of brokering of those relationships. So uh, there's ongoing um, support and troubleshooting that's happening. Uh, and it's our goal, again, working with our uh, partners at the state level to have um, uh, robust templates and, and workflows uh, ready to go to shore up the gaps and, and make sure that every community that needs it has a, a model um, for a, a complete infectious disease protocol. Excellent, thank you, David. Uh, we know that Alana may not be able to jump on this call or certainly not at this point. Is Alana on yet? She is. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Alana. How are you? Good, thanks for joining us. Good. Um, I don't have a lot to add Today, um, we've gotten more information on CDBG as it relates to CARES Act funding. Um, and we just hosted a call with all of our 23 entitlements uh, earlier this morning, sharing with them um, what we know as of the moment in terms of how to begin to prepare to apply to us for the CARES Act funding. Um, we, I did also on the call encourage uh, all of them to continue to partner with all of you so that uh, the CDBG funds are used to the greatest extent possible to respond to needs, uh, re obviously related to COVID, but they must also, the CDBG funds in particular, respond to needs that cannot be funded by another source. Um, there was a duplication of benefits provision put into the CARES Act. Um, I don't yet have the list of all the other sources of funds that might be available, um, but our CDBG grantees will be required to have a protocol for checking each activity for duplication of benefits. 
Uh, so what we're recommending to them at this point is that as they put out their public notice uh, for their substantial amendment to their plan, that they list a range of activities so that, you know, in the event uh, the list comes out and something they were thinking of funding is being funded by something else, they'll still have the wiggle room within the notice that they already put out uh, to fund something else that might be similar to that activity, but not necessarily the same. Uh, so we've gotten uh, a lot of advice and guidance this week on that. Uh, you should probably also know the home program, although the home program um, is not receiving any additional CARES Act funding. Uh, there, there was a release this week of four home program suspensions, eight waivers, many of which uh, refer to TBRA. Uh, there will be guidance given to our home participating jurisdictions next week. On Monday, actually, there's a webinar scheduled for all of them uh, where our headquarters team will go through the suspensions, the waivers, um, and answer any of their questions. So I'm just putting that out there because that might be an option uh, given the flexibilities that are now also associated with the home program uh, to address some of the housing needs in the state. Um, and that's basically been it for this week. Great, thanks Alana, and thanks for all of your support and the support of your staff. We are so lucky to have a close partnership with HUD. Not every state and jurisdiction has it. We don't take you or your staff for granted. So thanks for all you do. So we'll take a quick moment to see if there are any questions. You're able to type questions throughout the presentations, but we do wanna allow time if there are questions. So let's move on at the end of the next uh, section of slides, there'll be another opportunity to answer any questions that come in between now and then. So Housing Innovations is gonna give us some updates from our corner of the world, CT Boss, new yep. and improved. Hi everybody, good morning. Um, this is Suzanne Wagner talking and we're just going to, do a few updates um, on, on things we've been keeping you guys uh, posted on. What we're trying to do with each uh, presentation is just really include new information unless it's really important and we want to repeat it um, for you. So uh, if you have not been able to be um, on a previous webinar where we talked about the waivers or some of these other updates, just want to encourage you to go to that, uh, what, our website and the red COVID button to get uh, prior presentations. Um, so everybody I'm sure though does know that there is a waiver for HQS both um, for new units as well as um, uh, units that are already uh, under lease. And uh, last week we talked about video streaming. Now uh, people can use photographs because obviously not everybody's got video streaming capacity. Um, we do, do want to document uh, who uh, did take the pictures, the address of the unit and include that in the um, chart. And, and one of the things we'll be talking about a little bit later is um, all of the information about the different waivers and the various waivers that have been put in place, which are going to be really helpful and are, hopefully have been helpful already, require documentation in the charts. And uh, that's going to be um, something that we'll uh, continue to provide information on. Um, I see that Alice Minervina raised her hand, and I don't know how to do anything about that. Alice, do you want to talk? Yeah, just super quick. I wanted sure. to, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, um, just really quickly, I wanted to mention that in regards to the HQS while we're talking about it, that um, I did send out yesterday the DEMAS policy regarding the waiver HQS waiver um, as request as required by HUD. Um, so for those of you uh, who are subrecipients of HUD, of DEMAS, that covers those programs. Um, and I just want to thank uh, Housing Innovations for all their work on that. I, I just wanted to, I meant to do it in my um, 
updates and I totally forgot. So thank you for acknowledging my hand. Okay, well, that's so there's a first time for everything. So that worked. Thanks, Alice. Great. Um, when we're talking about a reinspection of units, um, it really to focus on prioritizing when we are doing reinspections, units that are prior to seven, 1978 or housing a, a child under six or pregnant women in particular, of course, because of uh, lead uh, paint. So as I mentioned, HUD has a, uh, is rolling out guidance on um, the record keeping for these waivers um, and it includes requirements for policies and procedures and records that are kept by the grantee uh, on the agency level, as well as things that go into participants files. Um, last Friday's, or the 14th, HUD had a, a office hours uh, on the waiver documentation, and we will be providing you a summary very soon about the documentation requirements. Um, and then of course, if we can be helpful providing sample forms so people don't have to recreate the wheel, we will uh, be doing that as well. Uh, one of the things that we're hearing a lot about is uh, people who, and many, many of our population are people who have not filed taxes, did not have uh, social security, um, and did not have gross income over $12,000, so they didn't file a federal tax return in 2018 or 19 and don't plan to. So we have a link here about um, what nine filers need to do because they do need to go uh, to the web and provide information about how they can receive payment. Um, and if people do not have bank accounts, which is also the case um, for many of our folks, a mailing address where that um, uh, economic impact payment can be sent. Um, and there is a web portal under development um, by the IRS. Anybody who has filed their taxes in 2018 or 2019 or get social security benefits should automatically receive uh, that payment. And there is a link in here to click on that for more information. Um, like previous uh, meetings, we will post these ASAP after this meeting today if people don't have them yet so you can uh, take advantage of all the links. So one question that's also come up is what about uh, people who do get the uh, economic impact payment um, for themselves and or their dependents and it is considered and what happens with rent and income calculation. And this is a kind of funds that's temporary, it's sporadic, it's non-recurring as we all know it's a one shot. So it does not uh, need to be uh, included in the COC income calculation. And then there's a link to uh, a stimulus flyer for clients who are homeless about how to get the money. Finally, I think, finally, sorry, I um, uh, can't always, oh no, got two more things. If your APR is going to be late related to um, COVID, you wanna make sure you reach out to the field office to request an extension. Um, everybody knows your APRs are due 90 days after your uh, the end of your grant year. You can get them in so we don't get further piled up, but also know that many people are on a shoestring and have staff out and are just not able to get that done. So make sure you reach out to HUD. And I'm sure Alana would say preferably before it's due to request an extension. Yes, please. <laughs> Thank you, Alana. Um, just uh, one thing we're going to try to con up, oh, Alice, raise your hand. Alice. Um, and for those of you who are subrecipients of DEMAS, um, you, you know, we are responsible to uh, work with you on the APR submission. So uh, much like Alana, if you would like, if you need an extension or help with anything, reach out to us sooner rather than later. Um, you know, we don't want to push it up to the, to the due date and, and um, have anything, you know, happen um, to negatively impact uh, that. Um, and one other quick thing, I know Lisa Callahan has been reaching out to a lot of providers. Um, HUD has been, thank you so much, working diligently on um, the grant agreements. So we need to fill out our terms and conditions. So I know Lisa has been reaching out to everybody. So if, if you could um, be those, um, the terms and conditions, that would be super helpful. And I promise, well, I can't promise I won't raise my hand again. No, no, Alice, it's helpful. I'm, I'm glad and I'm glad I can see it and that you can jump in. I think it um, makes us in the information um, fills out 
fills in the gaps and questions that people may be having. So thanks. Uh, okay. Um, last uh, week we had our um, our kind of uh, um, information, a presentation uh, part of the program was about working with substance users. Sean Lang did a great job on that. She talked a lot about um, using Narcan and helping people be safe uh, and acknowledging that substance use does increase risks for people during COVID. Um, and that may be because they they can't access their supplies um, or they are hoarding supplies and maybe at heightened uh, overdose risk. Um, they often have uh, illnesses or coexisting conditions that put them at higher risk of um, of uh, unfortunately catching the virus. And we have been trying to keep up with the risks. Um, I'm sorry, keep up with the risks and the resources. And so there's a list of links. I want to call out King County as a overdose prevention and harm reduction guidelines. It's two pages. I know people are overwhelmed with, there's so much information um, out there. Um, so we're trying to help you focus on things that might be most useful. The safe drinking tips uh, also are very uh, good, useful document, but all of these are, are good resources. And we'll continue to kind of keep updating um, uh, pieces of information that we think might be helpful as we work with folks and, and as this um, uh, unfortunate crisis continues. And then really the last uh, update, uh, which as John already mentioned, is that we have our steering committee meeting. It'll be abbreviated uh, today at 1230. Hopefully we'll be done by one, but we've scheduled to 115. And there's the information if you're going to call into the uh, steering committee. As we said, it'll be a very uh, brief agenda. Okay, uh, I'm gonna pause and see, does anybody wanna raise their hand? <laughs> does anybody have a question? I'm sorry, I had to take off the full screen view. It, I just kept on, I know, um, messing that up. Uh, I don't see any questions in the Q&A. We must be clear as bells today, huh? Everybody or everyone's exhausted, probably a little bit of both, maybe. Um, all right, well, you know how to reach us if you have questions. Um, I didn't miss anything, right? No. Okay. Um, there is, uh, we'd like to get, get your input on some things. And so as everybody knows, there are already uh, waivers in place for HQS. There are waivers in place for around evictions from public housing, et cetera, et cetera, to help us uh, be able to manage a crisis and, and take good care of homeless folks. And so we wanted to put the question out and HUD has been um, asked this question, Alana has talked about it, is to provide feedback to them about what other kinds of waivers might be helpful as we seek to do this work and house people quickly if possible um, and take advantage of our housing resources. So if there are other rules or regulations that you find are an impediment to uh, doing the work now, um, please either respond in the Q&A right now or submit um, to our Gmail address, um, any additional uh, waivers. We've already submitted uh, a, a few uh, waivers that the state has identified would be helpful, but you guys out on the front lines in particular would really like to know if there's other things that are, um, are slowing you down or preventing you from helping folks. Okay, I see some, uh, a red thing popped up in the Q&A. Possible waiver might be a change in population. Can we also do singles? Or if we do DV, can we share resources so we can help those who are category one homeless? Okay, good. Anybody else, please, please feel free to um, put those forward and we'll, we'll take them forward from there. Great. So next slide. I'm trying, there we go. Who put Suzanne in charge of the slides? You know, gonna, you know, I think I'm going to get fired from this job. I'm I, sorry. I think so. So many of us are very familiar with Suzanne and with Liz and Lauren. Uh, we're getting to know Shannon, but there are other people behind the scenes at Housing Innovations. And one of those people is Andrea White. Uh, she's waving now. Uh, 
and she's going to walk us through some slides on supporting staff and ourselves during this crisis. So, Andrea, take it away. And I think if you need to, just say next slide, and Suzanne will do her darndest to uh, make that happen. Got it. Thank you. So, good morning, everyone. It's really nice to be here with you. One of the things, as John said, we're going to talk a little bit about self-care. So we're going to talk a little bit about both the structure that will help people cope um, and also the support that will help people cope. So this is what we're going to go through this morning. So Suzanne, next slide. So COVID-19 has been really a long-term crisis. And it's hard for people to tolerate being in crisis for long periods of time. It can create chaos. It can create a reactive sort of response from staff, which really contributes to people being overwhelmed. People are tired. They're sad. They're grieving. They're worried. And they're also frustrating because, as always in a crisis, it's taken a while for the resources to come into place. Um, so that everybody needs a little hope. And in this case, a lot of the hope comes from re re realizing we'll weather the crisis and everybody needs a little structure. And structure does a couple of things. It makes your day more predictable, but it also gives people an idea of what's expected of them. And in a crisis, a long-term crisis, it's really hard for people to figure out if they're doing a good job. So, you know, it's, it's support from the supervisor. We're also going to really highlight support from the team, which contributes to a feeling that we're not doing this alone. So this is really targeted at you all, but for to provide support to the frontline staff. A lot of these techniques really work for us as well, but let's go through them. So can we do the next slide, Suzanne? So. One of the things that we want to do is we want to help people develop a predictable schedule. It's good for the people we serve. It's good for the people that are serving them. It's also good for us. And one of the things that we suggest is people schedule sort of an on-site meeting. These are for people that are on-site, which you have some people about, that they just meet. It could be when you usually do how the shifts change or whatever you're going to do in the morning. But just to get an idea of what happened the day before, what are the really prioritization for the task during the day, who's going to do what, and it's an opportunity for, to, for people to offer support at that. We also want to assign <clears throat> tasks by competency and really support people's competency. So maybe Alice is the you know, benefits whisperer. So instead of meeting with me today, you're going to meet with Alice. Maybe John is the person that really can help with families. So you know what? There have been some issues with the families. You want, to, you want to reconnect with your family, and that's something that John can help you with. So it also gives people an idea that there are a lot of people there to help them. It also takes the pressure off the primary worker, but it also makes people feel like they're part of a team and we're in this together. We're also going to use these meetings to identify patterns that are coming up and help staff problem solve as a group. So an example of that, particularly in shelters, if any of y'all run shelters, is that, okay, we've got a group of clients that are going in and out every day. So what can we do to help them to be able to stay inside and to be calmer? And you know, problem solving can be anything from you know, on-site bingo and things for people to do to you know harm reduction techniques that Suzanne mentioned. So you want people to be able to do some group problem solving and yes this is encouraging more meetings. We also want staff to be able to talk about where they've made progress with people and techniques that worked. It leads to people's feelings of competency but it also leads to a belief that we're going to get through this. So it increases people's hope. We want to stick to a schedule for meals and medications and supply drop off so that it doesn't feel so out of control to really combat some of those feelings of being overwhelmed. And we also want to provide supervision and supervision is really important, both individual and group supervision, because it gives people a chance to talk about what their feelings are and that everybody that works with us 
has a lot of feelings about this COVID crisis, as do we all, and we need an opportunity to talk about that. The other thing is that people need an opportunity to deal with their grief. And that moment of silence and remembering people and saying people's names and sharing grief across the team can really provide people with a lot of support. Okay, next slide. Some of your people are remote and remote is hard. Working at home is hard. If you can see from the cartoon, half the people probably have kids at home. I mean, a lot of people are on mute because of the dogs that are coming in. So we wanna really think about that. People at home even more need a daily schedule, right? So to do a daily sort of briefing in the morning where members of their teams, and some of your people are gonna be, I know with outreach, some people are a team of their own. Maybe they can meet with other people who provide similar services and talk about what's the priority for today? Who are we, who are we gonna talk to? How can we, um, how can we do this? Um, maybe somebody else can help out. It's also individual supervision to talk about individual situations. And this is gonna sound counterintuitive, but one of the things that individual supervision does is helps people see the future. So certainly a lot of the people that you work with are in school and the schools are either virtual or they may have some worries about that. They may have some financial worries and those really interfere with them being able to provide as much help as they would like to people. So we want to be, give people an opportunity to talk about what their fears are and what they're experiencing in terms of grief. Grief, a lot of people have, you know, friends and colleagues that are very sick. We also want to do some problem solving with uh, coworkers and, you know, once again, really reinforce that we are all in this together and acknowledge the expertise. We also want to temper people's expectations. If people are only looking at how many people they placed or different things, that is going to be hard for people. And we want to really look at process goals and really reward the process goals. It's great that we've figured out a plan for people to address their substance abuse while they're in their housing. And we know that was a really big thing. And can you talk a little bit about that? So we want to really acknowledge some of the things that people have been able to accomplish. And then we want to make sure that people understand what are the expectations. That priority list helps do that, but also we want to really reward people for that. We want to also provide some sort of outline for calls. I don't know if a lot of people have done those sort of calls with people, but it's hard not to know what to do. One of the things that we see with people all the time is that um, even when they go to a home visit, it's very hard for them to sort of stick to some sort of plan or even integrate the service plan. It's even harder when people do that by phone. So we provided sort of an outline. And of course, these are just recommendations and you can do anything you want with it. Um, so we want to encourage people to talk. We want people to feel as part of a team. We want to really encourage people to take breaks. It's easy to do that sort of lunch at your desk. People need to step away from their desk you know, encourage people to take a walk during the day. And the other thing is really acknowledge, sometimes people take a lunch and then their kids are, you know, screaming at them and they've got to review homework or homeschooling, which sounds like its own brand of hell. So one of the things that we want to do is make sure that people take a break and give themselves some time and really talk that through with people. We can do some of that in supervision. Okay, next slide. We want to recognize people for acts of kindness. There's some been extraordinary things that people have done during this crisis. And one of the really important things in the work that we do is kindness is oftentimes um, under acknowledged, but also is a really important part of our work. We also want to acknowledge people for competency. If people feel like they're competent at their job, they're more likely to do a better job. We want to set some reasonable goals. We talked about this. We might start start saying, you know, how many how many benefits applications does this team want to accomplish in a week or a month? Um, to really focus people on tasks. 
how about we discuss the housing options for people? It may be difficult for people to see housing, but how about we discuss the housing options and develop a plan with people? And how many people are we gonna do this with? Um, you know, how many people can get involved in an activity? This does two things. One is it creates real goals for people, but it also really um, supports the fact that unless people are able to engage their clients in work that doesn't automatically involve them, right? So unless the client, unless they're able to use these resources, it's gonna be very difficult. You don't want a client that is talking about 1-800, let me call my case manager, because you just don't have time for that. So that you want people to have other things to pull on, and that's a really important thing to help people do. We also want to give people ideas, and these are some things that came from other places. Um, one of the places that's working in a hotel had this brilliant idea where people sit in their doorways with masks on and they play bingo. Um, and one of the things they got people to play bingo is, is they play bingo for gift cards. Um, another one is um, sort of that junk food treats that we've all been indulging in. I see you all. Um, you know, have things like, yeah, me too. Have things like that be there. Those crispy Cheetos are a really popular bingo item. So thinking about ways that people can do things that take their mind off of it, and they can also do self-care, but that also reduces the pressure on the workers. Harm reduction plans, this is a good way, you know, I wanna see a couple of harm reduction plans this week. Um, it's a good way to really acknowledge that expertise, to get people to focus on the task, but also to let people know that they're doing a good job. We wanna talk about post-crisis, I talked about that. We wanna reward the problem solving. And we also wanna look for empathy, and this is a good thing to do in the team. Look, it's really frustrating. If you have somebody that is out every day, just going out and maybe collecting cans or going out to buy buy drugs and stuff and the person says i told him a million times he can't do that it's really frustrating and it's hard to work when you're that frustrated so you want to use the team too to develop empathy and also recognize that we can't solve all problems that's just impossible and a lot of times the people that join this 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 um this work really want to solve problems we're gonna develop policies to ensure that if somebody dies, they'll be remembered. This is something that really weighs on workers and we've heard this a lot. It is particularly bad because photos of Potter's Field have been posted all over the news and that sends a chill down people's spine. People wanna believe that if they're gonna die, that somebody will be with them, which is now possible in a lot of hospitals and also that they'll be remembered. And we wanna make sure to make sure that the workers know that too. And just always give people the message, we'll get through this together. Okay, let's do the next slide. This is just an outline for a possible structure for the client meetings. Absolutely, you wanna check in, find out how they are. You wanna do some education about what symptoms they're gonna look for, what's the information about the CDC. This is also a good time to, um, talk to people about the myths that are um, around the internet. There's all these myths that different groups are immune from COVID, that's certainly not true. So let's talk about where they came from, let's, uh, let's ask them questions. If somebody's delusional, obviously we don't wanna confront the delusion, but we also want to you know, work with their feelings around these things. We wanna make sure that people have basic needs met and that will include masks and gloves and things like that. We wanna ask about family, friends, if they're lonely, we wanna check in a little bit about their mental health. Then we wanna ask them what they did this week, right? Do they have the things that they need to keep themselves busy? Because if you're just sitting around and you have nothing to do, it's gonna start spin. And we saw that, we see that when people move into permanent supportive housing all the time, but we really wanna focus it on here because it's amplified. We wanna to refer to a plan, we want people to have a plan. A plan big brings people structure and purpose and people need structure and purpose to survive. And then we wanna teach some problem solving skills and help people evaluate how things are working. These are some resources for that. 
And then the next slide is really about supervision. We want to meet with people. I mean, I know you guys are all really busy and your supervisors are really busy and they're probably doing some direct services themselves, but we want to keep to a schedule and supervision. If you can do some individual supervision, that's great because people really need to talk about what they're feeling and they may not be able to do that in a team. There's also a lot of frustration and there's a deep sadness in people from grief, from losing people, from seeing people be so scared. That usually put me into a grief response is when my clients were scared, it just, it made me feel incompetent and it made me feel overwhelmed, but it also made me really sad. People need a chance to talk about that. There's a lot of good information about grief counseling. We can be sure to put that up, but that, you know, Kubler-Ross's stages of grief can really give you a lot of guidance, but that's something really important. Team meetings, I've spent a lot of time on that. It's a good opportunity to, you know, share resources, help people feel like they're in it together to reinforce the schedule. We also want to make sure and we want to check in on team meetings, individual supervision, and when we talk to people, everybody has the PPDs that they need, meaning masks and gloves, and in some cases, gowns, so that that's something we want to really make sure of in the team meeting and check on a regular basis. The daily briefings can go over tasks, what people have been able to accomplish, and it's a good point to maybe spend 10 minutes on telling a good story. One of the things that some people do is they do moments for mission, which is what are the good things that have happened this week? And they can be anything. They can be my kid made her own breakfast to, you know what? One of my clients has actually been able to use the online AA meetings and found them pretty helpful. We want to make sure that people maintain the social distancing guidelines that and that people are comfortable that and that's reinforced in the job. It's just to remember that, that we're all this in together. And so you heard a lot of team stuff here because that's what it is. And we will get through it. We want to build hope so people can give hope to their clients. It, you know, people want to help and they feel frustrated. So they need tools and directions and that everybody is affected. So this is around the supervision and that people need an approach and giving people an outline, which they can, you know, change obviously per client, but that really helps. It increases people's feelings of competence, but it also increases people's feelings about not being overwhelmed and being more in control. Andrea, you so, did a gonna... fabulous job. <laughs> you got through a lot <laughs> of slides you. that we'll be passing on to people. Um, and, uh, Really appreciate your spending time with us today. So the slide that's up now for folks who can't see it is a very cute puppy that's saying happy Friday. So we're wrapping up our time together here uh, next week. Same time, same bat channel, and the topic will be reducing the educational impact for the homeless or formerly homeless students. So we're looking forward to that presentation. A reminder that the QA box is open. If you have questions, if you wanna see other topics covered, either use that in the next two minutes or send us something through the Balance of State email. And uh, just a reminder that we'll continue to have at the end of our slideshow, the most current uh, resources that we can get our hands on. And the last slide is our wonderful staff at Housing Innovations. They're here 24 seven to do our bidding. So if there's anything that you want from them, they, they may even write your APR for you, um, but no guarantee. So anyhow, folks, I really appreciate that uh, there were so many people on the line today and we hope that our time together was useful, informative, soothing. Um, so let's just end with a deep breath in and out. Actually, I learned a new one from last week. It's called the four box. It's not just in and out. You have to hold your breath for like four seconds and then let it out and hold it for four seconds. So we'll do that for the second round. Just deep breath in. 
four, three, two, one. Let it out. Four, three, two, one. It can also tell you whether your lungs are compromised. So one last time, and then we're gonna sign off. Deep breath in. Four, three, two, one. Breath out. Four, three, two, one. You guys are great. We'll see some of you in a half hour. Get your uh, donuts from Waterbury if you have them. Otherwise, uh, you're on your own and we'll see some of you at 1230. Be kind to yourself, be kind to others. Take care.